This video is sponsored by Insta360. Hey, so back in December, my good friend Xyla Foxlin and I flew a Christmas tree to 300 feet. On that flight, we strapped a few X3 cameras from Insta360 and the shots we ended up with were super cool and unique. About a month later, several friends and I decided to fly a bunch of rockets at FAR and I thought to myself, what if I took one of those X3 cameras but flew it higher and faster? To answer that question, I took the X3, bolted it onto the nose cone of a little two inch diameter rocket and flew it as a two-stage vehicle to about 2,500 meters, passing just over Mach 1 on the way up. This thing survived like a champ, and much like the Christmas tree, the Insta360 X3 performed beautifully and got some very cool shots. Inspired by the success of this little two-stage rocket, I wanted to go higher and faster, so I purchased two L1000 rocket motors with the plan to stack one on top of the other, yeet them up to 30,000 feet, Mach 2.5, and, and capture some interesting footage along the way. So speaking of footage, the X3 is cool and all, but to be honest with you, I do have some doubts as to whether this would survive as being the nose cone for a Mach 2.5 rocket. Luckily, my friends at Insta360 were interested in working together again on a new project but this time, instead of the X3, they're interested in talking more about their new camera, the Go 3. The Go 3 is their newest in a lineup of their Go cameras, which are these little stick form factors. It's such an interesting shape, and it allows you to get a lot of shots that you couldn't get from a traditional action camera. The camera is also magnetic too, which opens up a whole world of other mounting options, including a chest cam. This chest cam feature, where you wear a little magnet necklace, ended up coming in super handy during the launch process, and we'll cover that a little bit later. One of the wildest parts about this camera, though, is something that Insta360 calls the action pod. This is like a little base station for your camera where you can recharge it, view what's on the screen, you can even use it as a selfie mode, and oh, what's that? It doesn't just work as a screen when it's connected, it works as a screen when it's wireless. That's right, the action pod is wireless, which means that I can control all of the settings, view what I'm shooting, and even turn the camera on completely wirelessly so long as these two are in range. Apart from that though, the camera records at 2.7K, has a ton of stabilization features, and it allows you to crop in post-production because of how wide the field of view is. In addition, the camera comes with lots of accessories, so you can pretty much mount it anywhere, including underwater since it's waterproof. And because of the free frame video feature, you can reframe clips and change aspect ratios after. The app also features an AI-driven auto-editing feature, which makes this a great tool no matter your skill level. So anyway, with all of that covered, let's build a rocket to fly this thing to 30,000 feet. I cooked up a design using Open Rocket, then I settled on a fin shape for each stage, and I started getting to work. The base of the fins is cut from 8th inch carbon fiber. I went with a low height swept shape on the upper stage. I used a belt sander to put chamfers on the leading and trailing edges of the fins, and I moved pretty fast through this whole build process, which from zero to launch took just over two weeks, about 16 days. The chamfers were pretty quick and dirty, and once done, I attached these to the upper stage using CA in a 3D printed fin jig. Now with the fins, it's time to do some fillets, and give that root bond more strength. I did this using G5000 rock epoxy and a few 3D printed fillet tools. One benefit of these swept upper stage fins is that because the root length or the length against the rocket is so long, we get much more bond area for our fin. More bond area helps your fin stay on, but it also increases the stiffness of the fin, which helps fight flutter. That's a super annoying phenomenon where the air flowing over your fin hits a resonant frequency and your fins turn to jello. Anyway, once the fillets are on there good and smooth, it's time to prep for a composite layup. After sanding the crap out of the surface, I tried a new technique for getting the layup cloth cut to size. I laid down strips of blue tape, trimmed them to the size of the fins, removed the tape, then got rid of the tape stickiness by spreading the thermocells across it. Then I used that to trace the outlines in the fiberglass for our layup. I used seven and a half ounce and two ounce cloth left over from building the Lumineer fin can, and I cut it all out with a pair of electric scissors, which do a great job of keeping the edges clean. I also used the epoxy left over from Lumineer, and man, 
This stuff was very expired. <laughs> the difference in color after thermal cycling in a garage for two years was intense. Because of this, I did a small test layup first with a heat cure to ensure it still worked, and then I began laying up the fins. Much like Lumineer, I used multiple layers of fiberglass which got infused with epoxy before placing them on the fin can. To save time, I laid up all four sides at once, and then I moved a space heater nearby to help speed up the process. After the cure, there's still this nasty edge on the side that we need to get rid of, and I did that using my belt sander. This process is a little bit nerve-wracking, and you've got to be careful, but the result is quick and it's pretty clean. I repeated this identical process right around the same time with the booster. Fins attached with a 3D printed guide, filleted with rock epoxy and a 3D printed tool, sanding everywhere, fiberglass cut guide got made using blue tape, then fiberglass got cut out, infused with laminating epoxy, and placed onto the fins of the booster. After curing, the excess was sanded off, and boom, our two fin sections are done. Although, of course, no rocket is really done without paint, right? So let's get some on this bad boy. I started out with a coat of semi-gloss white on both stages, and then I moved on to accent colors. For the first time ever in my life, I used blue tape for its intended purpose and not as a work holding strategy, and I masked off the area around the fins and edges, then I used black paint over the top once the white paint had dried. Finally, I know that Insta360's defining accent color is this intense yellow, so I put small accent marks on the edge of the fins on both stages. The final result was pretty striking, and even though it's annoying to spend the time letting paint dry, I personally think it was worth it. Paint makes the rocket go faster. Anyway, while this paint dries, we haven't talked much about how these cameras are gonna work on this rocket, so let's do that. When Insta360 hit me up, they were specifically interested in getting a product marketing shot. The idea was to have two cameras. You'd have this, the main feature camera, and then you'd have another one looking back at this camera to get a shot of this sticking out the side of a rocket. Now, for obvious reasons, if you have a two inch diameter rocket and you stick this camera out the side of it, that's gonna be a disaster aerodynamically speaking. But the thing is that these aerodynamics are really only a problem when the vehicle's traveling fast. So, what if you only fold out the camera when the vehicle's traveling slowly? The idea would be that a few seconds before Apogee, both cameras would fold out the side of the rocket, look back at each other, get that product marketing shot as the parachutes come out, and it would be a win-win because you could fold them back in to keep the vehicle aerodynamic on the way up. I was pretty jazzed about this design. It's a little overcomplicated, but that's sort of par for the course for this channel. So let's hop into Onshape and make it. Here in Onshape, I'll start off by creating a rough model of the camera and uh, I should address the name. The rocket is called EBDB. The first stage is EB, the second stage is DB. Uh, sometimes rockets need cool names and sometimes you see a funny tweet and you go, that should go on a rocket. And that's, there's no other meaning. I just thought it would be funny. <laughs> anyway, here's our rough camera model and we'll create a little bracket on the back to hold the camera in. This will get 3D printed and it snaps right into place to hold the camera. The Go 3 has these nifty little clamp points on either side and it lets you get a much stronger connection than you could with a magnet. Since we're 3D printing this though, I'll also end up zip tying the camera down just in case. Finally, we'll create this base which hinges the camera mount driven by a servo at the back. The mount will be commanded to fold out near Apogee so that both cameras can look at each other right as the parachutes come out at around 30,000 feet. I connected the servo to the camera using a little push rod and then I finished the avionics part of the build. I tossed an Ava flight computer on both stages and the upper stage also got an easy mini computer sort of piggybacked on Ava as a backup. Each stage beams out telemetry at 900 megahertz using an RFD 900 radio and on the upper stage I cut holes in the side of the vehicle using a Dremel to mount those cameras. While doing this I also played around with mounting the Go 3 camera in fun places and using it to view the inside of the rocket. Okay, POV, you are my parachute and I'm shoving you in a rocket. This awesome little camera turns out to be small enough that with a little hot glue and a little bit of luck, you can mount it to the side of the drill chuck to get the weirdest drilling shot you've ever seen. You might also notice that on the upper stage avionics, the back of the printed part looks a little burnt. Well, if you're new here, you might not know, it's a time-honored tradition here at BPS to slightly burn the avionics in the days leading up to the launch. For this time, I miscalculated the distance to the LiPo, I drilled into the lithium polymer battery, and the battery got so happy that it released a ton of smoke. Anyway, the only real damage was to the battery, and while I get the rest of the parts mounted here, let's talk about rocket motors. Each motor gets set up with a boat tail at the end to reduce drag. 
The upper motor gets an ejection charge plug so that the two flight computers can trigger the chutes, and the first stage gets to use its charge as a backup, but it needs a mount on the top to tie parachutes into. The upper stage motor also serves as the coupler to attach the two stages, and the hope is that because it's fairly loose, when the first stage finishes its burn, the drag on the first stage will be greater than the drag on the second stage, and the two vehicles will drag separate. The second stage motor also gets two strips of copper wire run down the side which get covered in electrical tape, and these will be the ignition leads when it's time for Ava to fire the motor. I placed an up-looking and down-looking camera on the booster as well as a backup, and then I got some final coats of paint over them. Finally, after getting most of the upper stage together, we tested the fold-out function with the Insta360 GO3 cameras. After this, I added a little Insta360 sticker, and I set up the upper stage for a pop test to make sure the chutes wouldn't come out. Very important context here, I used 500-pound Kevlar line to connect things up with parachutes, and for this specific test, I did not tie the sections together, and I'm sure that won't be a plot point later on. With the pop test complete, albeit a very powerful pop test, I used the last few days to run integrated testing. You know how I always have problems with GPS on these rockets? I dedicated an entire day to making sure we could avoid these problems, and it helped a ton. I was able to test, rearrange antennas, test again, improve shielding, and then know for certain that when I powered on this rocket, it would be happy, the GPS would pick up satellites, and we would be good to go, so that we don't have to make any one of those like, oh, fly without GPS calls at the launch site. I even ran these tests with a fake launch rail, too. After all of that testing was done, though, it was time to put some crucial EBDB labels on this thing, load the car, and drive out to FAR to get this thing launched. As soon as we got the rocket on the rail and powered on, I knew something wasn't right. All of that happy testing with the GPS that we had seen in my backyard was gone. It was just nothing. The booster could barely pick up any satellites, the sustainer couldn't pick up anything. But because this is not my first rodeo with GPS problems, I showed up with multiple backups. In the nose cone of the second stage, I placed a spot GPS tracker which can remain powered on for months. It sends its current GPS coordinates over the Global Star Satellite Communication Network, which means you don't need cell towers, you don't need ground stations, and if everything else on your rocket fails, and dies, it's a great backup to have. Spot trackers are actually how we found the Mark Rober egg drop vehicle after it fell from like 100,000 feet. And if that wasn't enough, I also placed a ComSpec tracker in the rocket as well. These little trackers send out beeps once a second at around 200 megahertz for a full entire week, so that even if you lose your rocket, you don't have GPS, you don't have you know, avionics power, you have this little thing that beeps out once a second for an entire week, and what you do is you go to the desert with this directional tracker and you just start walking until the signal gets stronger. So like, we have four ways to find this rocket. Because of all of these backups, we decided it was still safe to launch without GPS. And mark my words, I am coming back to FAR with a spectrum analyzer, a bunch of RF equipment, a ton of different avionics setups, and I am gonna find out what this FAR anomaly is. Why is it that everything works perfectly in my backyard and horribly at FAR? I'm gonna do it. Before the launch though, of course, we needed to double check that the cameras were rolling and everything was looking good, and luckily, because of this nifty little action pod, I could do that from the ground. With the camera mounted way up in the top of the rocket, we could check settings, modify things, start the recording all from the ground, and I still think that's like the coolest thing about this whole setup. Then finally, I hooked up the igniter. Once again, shout out to being hands-free with this chest cam and we were ready to send it. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred, one thousand meters, twelve hundred, fifteen, sixteen, keep going, keep seventeen, going. nineteen, two thousand, two thousand, three hundred. Ten seconds. There it is. And LOS on both oh. stages. Oh. Second stage I've got the right I have one. LOS. I got no I've data. Got the, I've got the left got one. Uh, three thousand six hundred meters. I. Uh, that's that's all I got. One packet. Okay.
The first stage ascent was a little wiggly, but otherwise fine, and near the end of the second stage burn, it was clear that something went horribly wrong about four kilometers up. Our first goal here was to find the booster, which had separated into two different pieces because of how violent that ejection charge was. Remember before when I said that I used 500 pound Kevlar line to attach the different sections of the rocket? I did use that, that's a lot of pounds. I also kind of used an amount of black powder. The pieces of the booster ended up being about 200 meters apart, the fin and airframe section was totally intact, and the avionics section got an extremely gentle ride down to the ground via the parachute. When we found it, it was still hanging out on the ground, happily beeping with a full cart of data. It's alive. Hey! And it's, and it's beeping in the like, hey, I know I've landed state. Um, I'm glad I put a bulkhead in. This is definitely hot staged. As for the upper stage, things were not looking quite as good, but they weren't looking bad. They were just kind of looking weird. So we had data coming in constantly at 10 hertz after the launch, claiming that the vehicle was stuck at like 3.6 kilometers. We know this isn't true because that's just not how physics works. So we can deduce that the navigation computer on Ava is probably not feeling so hot. But even if the data itself is stale, we know that we're still getting packets about 10 times a second, which means the avionics bay is probably intact and powered on. So next up, we decided to look at those GPS pings from the spot tracker in the nose cone, which claimed that the vehicle was chilling just outside of the far boundaries. And after a ton of searching, we did find the spot tracker. We just found it completely and entirely by itself. He's alive. Look, he blink. Nice, he blink. This tells us more information, right? We know that the vehicle probably broke apart because this was buried fairly deep in the nose cone. And because of that telemetry, we know that the avionics are still alive and within range. Next up, I got out the Comspec tracker to see if we could hear the ping from that little beacon that was attached to the parachutes, and we heard nothing complete radio silence. This gives us more information, although none of it is particularly fun. Because this tracker was attached to the parachute, we can assume that the parachute met a similar fate as the tracker, which is no longer with us. So most of the objects of the second stage probably came in without a parachute. As we kept hunting, we also got a call from my buddy Charlie Garcia, who had launched earlier and he was out recovering his rocket. Uh, Joe, this is Charlie. Um, What's up, Charlie? I found a lost rocket in the desert. It's White, yellow, and black. Any chance you know who it is? Whoa, that's crazy. You and me are talking about this for the first time, not the second time with cameras rolling. That sounds a little bit like my rocket. Charlie had found the bulk of the second stage with some signs that the impact on landing was less than ideal. But the avionics aren't part of this, so we know the avionics section is still out there somewhere, we just don't know where. We kept on with the search, and at this point, we were just forming a line pattern and combing through as much area as possible so that we could find pieces. We ended up finding the avionics section turned on and alive all on its own without a nose cone and it had just fallen without a chute. Actually, I should be more specific. It did not have no nose cone, it had part of the nose cone because the nose cone had just completely sheared in half. This is further evidence that the vehicle broke apart in a particularly violent manner. Because we got the avionics back though, that does mean that we have lots of data. And let me tell you, this thing was booking it. Our open rocket simulation claimed we were gonna reach about Mach two and a half, but our motors overperformed just a tad and the 3D printed boat tails on the bottom of each motor really helped reduce drag. So we actually got up to 1,024 meters per second. That is over one kilometer per second, Mach 2.98, which is just so close to three. But actually the trick here is that Mach 2.98 assumes that we're hitting that speed at sea level where the speed of sound is 343 meters per second, but we're not at sea level. The rocket hit that speed at four kilometers at which the speed of sound is 325 meters per second, which means that if we were going 1,024 meters per second divided by 325, the second stage was going Mach 3.1. This data also gives us an idea of what happened here, which is that during the second stage burn, right as the thrust began to taper off, the vehicle began aggressively turning sideways, pulling 61G. I'd love to see more data from this flight after that event, but that is the last data point we have. It seems like whatever happened was so violent that Ava just decided to take a nap. In terms of an anomaly investigation here, I have two leading theories for what caused the vehicle to break apart. The first is an early camera deployment, and the second is dynamic instability. Early camera deployment makes the most sense to me. So we have these fold-out camera mounts, and I doubt that Ava commanded one of them to fold out. 
The design has a little bit of backlash in there, and so what I think happened is that when you accelerate really hard with a rocket motor, you feel all of these positive Gs forcing you down. But as soon as that thrust tapers off, drag takes over and you feel a bunch of negative Gs. And that high negative G load coupled with the backlash in that foldout mount might have poked it into the airstream just enough. And if that thing hits the airstream at, you know, Mach 3.1, it's over. It will fold out completely. There's no way for the servo to resist that. That folded out mount would have shifted the center of pressure way forward on the rocket. And at that point, the vehicle is entirely unstable. It probably folds into like a Z and that's how we end up with multiple pieces. The other theory here is straight up dynamic instability, which is a common problem among high performance rockets. As the oblique shock in front of the vehicle changes shape, you want to have a large margin of stability to counteract it. Usually this comes in the form of high fins which poke out a little bit further from the vehicle. If I made these fins too small, it's possible that the vehicle could have lost stability because of how fast it was going, turned to the side, and then shredded. I see a little less evidence for this theory as we aren't oscillating before the vehicle turns to the side, and I would expect that dynamic stability problems would happen in a harder part of the burn rather than as the burn tapers off. Back to the recovery effort though, we were entirely missing those Go3 cameras, which were attached using the clamp mount, then secured with a zip tie, and then safety tied in with Kevlar, all of which failed, which is just more evidence to show you how violent this event was. I mean, there's no way that a camera could survive this, right? No way! Oh my god! No way! Oh my gosh, I bet it's usable. I'm gonna hit the button. Oh! Oh! Yeah! Oh! <laughs> Against all odds, literally all odds, we found this camera just chilling on its own in the middle of the desert. And one more time, I want to remind you of what this camera has been through. So this little guy went to Mach 3.1 in a rocket, fell out the side, smacked a fin on the way down, and then from four kilometers went into a free fall all the way to the ground, smacked the ground, and it works perfectly fine. You are watching me film on it right now. It's in great condition, other than the little, you know, just a little cosmetic damage. I worked with Insta360 on this video because I like their cameras. I think they build some really cool stuff, and I promise I did not mean to test it in this way, but it's a testament to the build quality of this thing that it could survive all that and still work in perfect condition. I really can't think of a stronger product endorsement or at least accidental endorsement than this. <laughs> and the only real damage here is this plastic front cover, which is literally designed to come off. You unscrew the lens cover, you take off this plastic piece, and you can swap it out with different types of skins for the camera. The footage from this flight wasn't exactly what we were looking for. You know, we didn't quite get that camera looking at camera shot, but it did provide some pretty sweet sights and sounds from its way up and subsequent freefall. And actually, as a bonus, we kind of did get that camera looking at camera shot because we were recording with this one at 120 frames per second, which means that as it fell out, we sort of got a look back at the other camera. It's just not exactly what we envisioned with the shot. One last thing before we wrap it up here, I do need to flex a little bit. Obviously the front section of that second stage is in pretty tough shape, but those fins stayed on. We went sideways at Mach 3 and the fins were fine. I think this tells us that the rocket wants to fly again, and I think we should do EBDB2. And if you want to see that, let me know in the comments. I want to give a huge thanks to Insta360 for sponsoring this video. Their Go3 camera comes out literally today. If you're watching this, it's out right now. This camera is not designed to survive a free fall from 13,000 feet in Mach 3.1, but they are hardy little cameras, and I think it's really cool that I got to try this on this rocket. You can learn a lot more about this camera, the Action Pod, and what these two can do using the links in the description down below. And once again, thank you so much to Insta360 for sponsoring this video. Thanks as well to you for watching it. We're gonna have more two-stage stuff coming up soon as we gear up for this space shot. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.